Hey folks, uh, Ben Wittes here, uh, in coming to you from the ballroom at Mar-a-Lago uh, with all the classified information in back of me. It is this week's episode of Trump Trials and Tribulations. I am joined today by uh, special guest Kyle Cheney of Politico. Uh, uh, Kyle, welcome to uh, uh, our merry little band. It is very good to be with you all. And and what is the uh, so I'm here in the in the Mar-a-Lago ballroom. Uh, what is the name of the room that you're joining us from? Uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna go and call this the aisle because I have my wedding photos behind me. So this is a uh, we're either in the, in the center aisle here. There you go. And Kyle, uh, uh, you uh, you have a kind of unique uh, uh, beat. You're sort of the the 9-11, uh, January one six uh, uh, litigation reporter or or criminal reporter at Politico. How do you define your your actual bailiwick? I, I struggle with this often, but I, I I think the best way to describe it is sort of the the intersection of of Congress and the courts uh, in terms of response. I mean, really, it's been sort of the the Trump investigations beat since 2016, but that has morphed into this um, Congress and courts uh, and how they have both responded to the post January 6th landscape. So that's the January 6th committee, the prosecutions of rioters, and the Trump investigations themselves. All right. Also joining us today from the Scant studio uh, in his palatial uh, Watergate apartment, Roger Parloff. Uh, uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. Every single component of my introduction of Roger today was true, except one. I'm going to let you all uh, determine which was the false. Was it that there are sconces in the studio? Was that it's palatial? Was it that it's in Washington? Was it that it's in the Watergate? You're going to have to figure that out. Anna Bauer, Lawfare's Fulton County correspondent. We are the only publication um, uh, that has a dedicated, you know, Trump uh, uh, national security publication that covers the Trump trials uh, with a dedicated uh, Fulton County correspondent. Anna Bauer, uh, where are you joining us from today? You know, Ben, I am running out of inspiration when it comes to naming the many, many rooms in my palatial mansion. <laughs> uh, so, and, you know, we're here, we're talking and we're going to talk about the First Amendment at some point today, I think. So I think I'm going to go and this is a lobby situation within, you know, the palatial mansion. So I'm going to go with the First Amendment lobby. The First Amendment lobby, which is not to be confused with, you know, the gun lobby or the, you know, the AARP or the Israel lobby, none of that. It's the First Amendment lobby of Anna Bauer's uh, palatial Georgia mansion. All right, folks, uh, we have had a relatively quiet week, but not a uh, not a week absent uh, uh, interesting events. Want to start with our special guest, uh, Kyle. We've got uh, we've had some interesting revelations about. Uh, Representative Perry and my hero, uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General or acting uh, Assistant Attorney General Clark. Um, uh, uh, what did we learn this week and how did we learn it? Sure. So, I mean, just to step zoom out a little bit, it's very crazy to me that three years after January 6th, there are still major plot points on the timeline that were that were that are coming out that are still we still don't know and we're learning um you know and, and I think this is what happened this week when the court of appeals um which has spent basically I mean there's been litigation going on uh, the FBI sees Scott Perry's cell phone over a year ago and they've been trying to get court permission to access it uh since then they there's been a couple of, of of rulings, including by the appeals court here, and in connection with that, the the circuit, the D.C. circuit, just unsealed a whole big batch of of filings related to that litigation. 
But in the process, they inadvertently unsealed uh, a very sensitive document that included a lot of the communications on Scott Perry's cell phone um, that were not supposed to have been you know, accessed by the government or, or made public in any way. Uh, this was posted publicly on the docket uh, for several hours before they pulled it down. And I and, and I think I think others, um, I'm sure a few others uh, obtained that document and, and found it highly newsworthy uh, because it described some of Scott Perry's extensive contacts in support of efforts to overturn the 2020 election. We've known he was involved, but not necessarily to the granular degree that the, this filing revealed and with who he was speaking, who he was reaching out to, high level figures, Trump White House, Trump campaign, outsiders who in sort of this shadowy cybersecurity world, you know, some fring fringy, very fringy people um, who he was strategizing with and Pennsylvania state legislators who he was hoping would take action in their own state. Whoops. Um, sorry, I was muted. Um, all right. So um, and what do you what do we make of this? I mean, at, at one level, um, the. At one level, you look at it and you say, yeah, we kind of knew that. Uh, you know, Clark came to Trump's attention through mm -hmm. Perry. Uh, it doesn't look like there's a case to be made against Perry, although maybe, right. maybe there is, you get, you got kind of prohibitive speech and debate clause immunity stuff going on in there. Mm -hmm. So where do you, where do you, what, what did you think the actual significance of like, is it mostly just a storytelling building the narrative kind of thing? Or do you think there's, you know, action that's likely to follow from this in any significant way? It's a good question. I, th I think that for me, right as I sit here right now, this just fill is sort of adds texture. It fills in the 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 Perry role in all this that had been a bit murky. We again, we knew we've long known he connected Jeff Clark to Donald Trump. Well, the first anecdote that I included in my story was a conversation he had with Jeff Clark on December thirtieth, twenty twenty, just a few days before Trump began to and then rescinded his appointment of Clark as acting attorney general. Um, in which Clark says, I'm nervous. I don't know if I'm ready for this. And he says, you are the, you, you are, you're the man, you're ready. This is God's plan. And to me, this just gives you a glimpse into the mindset of both of these men uh, on the cusp of this extraordinary moment uh, on, on that timeline. And then there's more because there were a lot of new names in this document that I hadn't seen before or had come up only glancingly that Perry was corresponding with people who were affiliated with Sidney Powell. These sort of, again, these cybersecurity experts, but they were much more, there was much more correspondence going on on this. And Perry was kind of viewed as a connector. He was, they would say, hey, can you tell Trump this for me? And Perry would say, yeah, I got you. Hey, I need to get on Fox News to talk about this. And Perry would say, I'll, I'll you know, marshal the troops on that. Um, and, and so I think people would come to him because as a lawmaker, he probably had access in ways others did not. Anna, you had a question? Yes. So, Kyle, one of the things that really interested me about your piece, uh, and, and you noted this in the piece, and then I believe Jeffrey Clark's spokesperson kind of followed up with you uh, about mm -hmm. it. I just wanted to ask you about it because something that came out in this filing and that you reported on is that there were these text messages between Jeffrey Clark and Scott Perry in which they're talking about this uh, suit that, you know, in which the civil division of the Justice Department was defending uh, Vice President mm -hmm. Pence against uh, an election related suit. The reason that I raise that those messages in which Jeffrey Clark basically tells Scott Perry Oh, the people in the civil division didn't, you know, want to have anything to do with my version of the of the brief for that case or the what I wanted to do mm -hmm. with that case. Uh, the reason I raise that is because I, you know, covered the removal proceedings in Fulton County where Jeffrey Clark, trying to move his case to federal court, had argued that he had election related duties uh, in as someone, you know, within the civil division at DOJ in part because he, you know, was involved in this Pence litigation. Mm -hmm. He claimed or his attorney claimed at one of the hearings that he helped direct and frame uh, some of the arguments in that case. So it was really interesting to see these text messages that seem to suggest 
that, you know, he uh, did not maybe direct and, and frame the arguments that were ultimately made in that case. Um, so kind of what's going on there and how should sure. we think about it? And and what did the spokesperson uh, say about it when you, sure. you contacted so, them? Uh, I've always been extremely fascinated by the, the suit, which was brought by former Congressman Louis Gohmert um, to try to force Mike Pence's hand days before January 6th, try to get him to say, yes, I have the power, get the courts to say, yes, Mike Pence, you have the power to choose which electors to count and which not to count. Um, and of course, the courts didn't touch it or they they quickly threw it out. But, um, you know, there's been some reporting over the last couple of years that that Trump was very upset with the Justice Department for stepping in to defend Pence, which it's kind of a normal function for the Justice Department to do. But I think in the context, you know, you know, they work for the theory, they work for Trump. And here they are taking a position that's contrary to Trump when Trump is wants Mike Pence to have that authority. Um, what I read that, that that text message as saying initially was kind of the same way you just described it, which was Jeff Clark saying, you know, Jeff Perry told him Trump is not happy with you because of how you're handling the Gomert situation, because Jeff Clark's name is on the brief defending Pence. And what Clark responded was the civil division didn't want anything to do with my brief. And so what I interpreted that as initially was he saying, that's not the brief I wrote, that's the brief they wrote. And what, what a spokesman pushed back on and said, was, no, 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 he's saying that is my brief. The civil division didn't like that brief. They, they mm. maybe, maybe they wanted to go further. Maybe they wanted to say more. What the position that Clark's brief took was that the the Gomer, that the litigants involved, it was a bunch of the false electors were also on that suit, had basically sued the wrong person. They, they why were they shouldn't be suing Mike Pence? They should be suing, essentially suing the Congress, um, which sets the procedures for the the joint session. Um, which also you can't really do because of speech debate matters and all that. But but uh, basically the, the DO, DOJ just said, you're, you're suing the wrong person. And I, it was kind of a way to defend Pence without really defending Pence. It was just sort of saying the suit was procedurally deficient. Got it. That's really interesting. Thanks. Sure. And so, but, but you're right. It was a little bit of an ambiguous message and that's why they pushed back so hard, I think. All right. Um, so are we, what else are we waiting for in the, in the, in that litigation? Is it, uh, I I've kind of lost track of mm -hmm. where things are with respect to representative Perry's cell phone, which is, I suspect sort of the point. It, it's kind of fascinating because we don't fully know. So what happened was judge Howell, who was chief judge at the time this suit originated, um, ruled very forcefully in the government's favor um, that they should have access to the vast majority of documents on Scott Perry's phone uh, that they were seeking, which she said were largely political in nature, weren't directly connected enough to his role as a legislator to be covered by the speech or debate clause. Um, and so big victory. Perry appealed that um, and the appeals court put it on hold, put, put Howell's ruling on hold. And then sat on the case for seven or eight months um, while they considered it uh, and eventually ruled in, you know, in September that Howell got some big things wrong in her ruling. Essentially, they said that any any contacts that he had with other members of Congress about the election process were protected, even though Howell said they were mostly political. And then the conversations with outsiders, people that I just described, these cybersecurity folks, the Trump administration folks, Jeff Clark, those had to be viewed, uh, assessed on a document by document basis um, to determine whether they were connected to Perry's role as a legislator or not. And it was a much more fact intensive process than Howell engaged in in her ruling. Um, now that I thought the, the government, I thought Jack Smith was gonna appeal that ruling. He did not. And the, the mandate was issued, um, I think just a, just maybe late October. And so that the appeals court ruling is now essentially the settled ruling in that matter. What it did was it sent the, it sent the matter back to the district court now to chief judge Boesberg, who's supposed to now go through document by document and decide which ones can go to Jack Smith. But the wrinkle is, I'm not sure that the grand jury is operating anymore in that, in, in the Trump matter. It's a big kind of a mystery at the moment. Um, there's been no activity from them. And so one of the questions people have raised to me is who's judge if Judge Boasberg does that analysis, there's no one to give it to. So there may not be anyone to give it to. So can he even do it? Is this thing just sort of sit, you know, dead and 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 moot at this point? Or is there actually going to be some further development? And I don't totally know the answer to that. 
And this kind of raises the larger question, which is um, what is going on in that investigation? You know, you have the six unindicted co-conspirators, all of whom remain unindicted. When at the time of the uh, the indictment that's now before Judge Chutkin, we'd kind of assumed, at least I had, that indictments of some of the mm -hmm. unindicted co-conspirators were coming. Now there's been, you know, a good long time. There aren't, haven't been any pleas and there hasn't been a subsequent indictment. And the ancillary activity associated with the investigation, like the, you know, sort of collateral investigation of Perry and, you know, a group of other, uh, um, you know, sort of actors at the per more peripheral edge of the post-election conspiracy have all sort of stopped or at least visible, you know, uh, we haven't seen a lot of visible signs of investigation. Right. Do you have the impression that Jack Smith has decided we're getting through a Trump trial before we're doing anything else? Or is there percolating uh, other activity that, you know, it's just not uh, overt? I mean, th this is what my colleagues and I spend a lot of time thinking about every day, trying to trying to suss out. I think, you know, there are experts we've talked to who said, I don't think the co-conspirators are getting charged. I think it's just not going to happen. You know, I think we even used and then when the initial charges against Trump came down, that one of the reasons Jack Smith charged or, or, or identified these six co-conspirators who were all attorneys was to sort of uh defang Trump's, you know, uh, advice of counsel defense. They say, of course, you relied on the advice of your counsel. They were all in the conspiracy with you. Um, and so, so, and then that, that, that may not ever lead to charges, but that was sort of more speculative. Um, and, you know, the grand jury did continue to meet for a few weeks after the, the Trump indictment. So we thought maybe these charges are coming. One theory of the case is that the, if the grand jury remained active, while the Trump trial is pending, it creates all kinds of discovery obligations should they obtain really sensitive or important uh, evidence. And that those are the kind of things that can delay trial dates, can throw off the timeline. And they're so in intent on trying to get this trial done as scheduled that I think they could just be staying dormant for, you know, during the pendency of the trial, the initial trial. All right. Um Let's, uh, so uh, Kyle, uh, feel free to jump in anytime. These are very free form discussions. And uh, anytime you have thoughts on any question I ask to anyone else, uh, don't be afraid to cut them off rudely <laughs> and uh, including me and, uh, uh, and you know, dominate the, the stage. Um, Roger, uh, let's talk about gag orders, because, uh, you know, we haven't gagged anybody in a while. We have, uh, let's start with a f the four judge panel. And I know what you're thinking, members of the audience, you're thinking, what the fuck is a four judge panel? Don't judge courts really either meet in three judge panels or in on bonk, which means however many judges are on the court in question. And the answer is New York is weird. You know, the, the trial judges are called Supreme Court justices and the judges at the Court of Appeals are the highest judges in the land. It's just old terminology. Uh, Roger, why is there a four judge panel in New York and what did it do? Well, actually, you know, the, these appellate division panels. This is the intermediate appellate court in New York. It's called the Appellate Division First Department for Manhattan. Um, uh, usually sits in five judge panels, so I don't know why there were only four today. Um, but it was, uh, they were ruling on the, uh, if you remember, the Judge Engeron's order. Uh, it was a uh, narrow gag order in the Trump civil case mainly uh, to try to get him to stop talking about his principal law clerk. And uh, I won't name her because she's un got enough problems as it is. But um, uh, so he entered an order to stop him from talking about her. And uh, he appealed and uh, a single uh, justice, as you say, of the appellate division. Um, they are also justices. Uh, stayed the order, 
And then today at about 1145, uh, the panel just um, lifted the stay. There was no uh, there was no real um, uh, ruling. It, 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 the uh, the the order was signed by the clerk. Uh, so um, I don't know if uh, that we, there might be a, 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 an explanation coming down, but I, I uh, for the moment I don't think so. So um, that one is now uh, lifted again. Um, now we're very interested, of course, in what's going to happen with the D.C. Circuit. Um, uh, uh, with Wait, Judge before, before, we, before we go to the D.C. Circuit, though. So now what is the status of, you know, how gagged is Trump in in the New York civil case? And what does that mean he can and can't say right now? I believe and I, I'm sorry, I didn't re look this up again. I, I believe he can't talk about the his principal law clerk who's been the subject of a lot of Trump's venom. Uh, I, I, uh, and I think that's the main thing. Do you know, Kyle, is there more? Any, any court staff, you're right, it, exe it exempts staff. the judge, but any of his staff uh, okay. are covered by the order. And um, the problem, I mean, he, he has made accusations. Well, that there's two sort of odd things going on there. One is that this judge, uh, Angeron, has his clerk sit at the bench. Uh, it's not a common thing. Um, I think I've heard of it happening once in another context. Uh, so uh, Trump's team has begun, say begun saying, oh, she's co-judging. Co uh, there's no evidence of that. They do pass notes. That is an, ubiquitous. I used to do that when I was a law clerk, you know, with with my judge. Um, so that is not a, a, a cause for complaint. The other problem is that they say that she has uh, given over the limit of uh, for political campaign contributions. Um, now, she uh herself was running for a civil judge position for a while. And so um, she's actually allowed to give certain kinds of uh, contributions. She's allowed to buy tickets to uh, uh, to political events that are used for as contributions. So anyway, uh, they're saying she's biased. Uh, one of these organizations, she bought a ticket to um, you know, supports Letitia James. I don't know the timing of these, whether this was before the case started or not. Um, but anyway, uh, there was, they've, they've tried, they've actually moved for a mistrial based on these sorts of allegations and in the uh, civil, uh, civil, New York civil case. And um, he, uh, Judge Engeron, uh, uh, dismissed that or uh, um, and will probably get another mandamus proceeding very soon about about that. You know, the, the mandamus is there is, is probably called an Art Article 78 proceeding. But that's sort of what's going on with the judge and why they want to uh, nominally why they want to uh, criticize her. But. The, this phenomenon came up, of course, uh, in the D.C. case when Judge Chutkin was crafting uh, a limited gag order in the in United States versus Trump. And um, one of the interesting things there is that in, in the D.C. case, the the prosecutors had a lot of evidence of how uh, the judge, the Trump's tweets um, incite uh, harassing uh, uh, emails, uh, uh, threatening uh, texts and emails and calls. Uh, but most of that evidence came out of um, the time period of 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 January sixth. Uh, you know the the twenty twenty election and the months after. So you know now three years ago. So one of the 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 issues that Trump's lawyers have said, well, you haven't proven that his tweets in this case are inciting um, violence and, and threats and intimidation and harassment. And what happened two days after the oral argument in D.C., 
is that Judge, Judge Engeron's um, own lawyer submitted to the First Department in New York uh, some documentation about what Trump's tweets have been doing up there. And, you know, you remember on October 3rd, uh, he did a tweet about the law clerk calling her Schumer's girlfriend with a picture of her with Schumer. And um, uh, posing with, with Schumer. And uh, that triggered, um, uh, 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 well, her, her, her cell phone was immediately hacked, I mean, uh, doxxed, her, her phone number, her emails, and she began to get, uh, she says, uh, well, the, the, a, a security officer for the court said, um, it was 20 to 30 threats or uh, uh, harassing uh, calls a day on the email, 30 to 50 on her two emails and LinkedIn account. And then they transcribed the some of the voicemail uh, threats coming in, uh, 275 pages, single spaced of them. And they are all really frightening venom which the uh, security officer took said he took considered very serious threats, and about half of them were anti-Semitic, and um, it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and and uh, after this, the day after, the government attorneys sent a copy of this same document to the D.C. Circuit, saying, "Well, you know, this case was discussed at." Chutkin's hearing, and it was in the briefing, here's an update. And of course, Trump's attorney said this is totally outrageous. You can't mention this. This is irrelevant. It's another case. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll see if that has any impact. And is the is there any, uh, how did the D.C. Circuit, I, I mean, this was transmitted, I take it, after the argument. Is that right? That's right. So we haven't heard, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't bounced back or anything. We don't know uh, how they've reacted. So we know that it is that there is a filing in the D.C. Circuit and it has been brought to the attention of the judges. And we have no idea how the judges are. Uh, I mean, other than the transcript and oral uh, a transcript of the oral argument and the um and the uh, audio of that, we have no movement from the D.C. Circuit on its own gag order situation. That's right. And they also have Trump's Trump wrote a short reply to the government having sent that document. Gotcha. So uh, we actually have a question from uh, Josh about um, the uh, D.C. Circuit case. So I'm going to bring that in now. Any guesses from any of the uh, panelists about when an opinion might be coming from the Chutkin, ga Chutkin gag order in light of the extended oral argument? Oh, and the uh, special counsel's filing on Thanksgiving about the New York civil fraud case and the consequences of pub Trump's public comments. So uh, Roger and uh, Kyle and Anna, do any of you have any sense of when we might be likely to hear from the DC circuit? Kyle, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think it may be a while. My That's my read from listening to the oral argument. Um, I, they, the judges who are all Democratic appointees, by the way, had some significant uh, reservations about the way that order, the, some of the, the language in that order and how it could be applied. And, and uh, they, they explicitly said, we don't want to be getting too de deeply involved in, in, you know, political campaign. Uh, they, they said that there, you know, there were, they just had concerns with the, with the vagueness of it, which were some of the same ones that, that Trump had raised about how you, and how you apply it. Um, and so our read was that, they were very likely to much to sharply narrow the order that Judge Chutkin imposed, um, but to sustain to, to 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 maintain some sort of gag on Trump. But it may be much much more limited than than what Chutkin issued. Um, it could be you know completely shorn of some of the 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 teeth that she was trying to put in it about the, the special. I mean, the the judges at the circuit were saying, why can't 
Donald Trump call out, you know, line prosecutors who he doesn't like, you know, why, why is that, why is that something he's not allowed to do to, to just criticize the conduct of the case against him? Why can't he, you know, get into some of these areas that uh, actually didn't even seem that controversial um, in the Chuck in order. Uh, and so given the questioning, I think they're going to take their time on it and craft something much, you know, and, and in the meantime, the Chuck in order is on hold. It's been suspended. And what's interesting about that is Chutkin very explicitly said, you shouldn't be attacking the family members of people involved in your case. And uh, now now Trump has since since the order was put on hold, gone after Jack Smith's wife and his family. And in New York, even even with the gag order in place related to Judge Engoron's staff, he's been attacking Judge Engoron's wife, uh, who allegedly had been posting social media posts that were critical of Trump. But as we learned today, the court is now disputing that and saying she never posted anything about Trump. Actually, minutes before I came on, we came on here, the court said all those allegations that Judge Engeron's wife was posting anti-Trump content are false. Um, but Trump has nevertheless been attacking her daily uh, while this is going on. And so you know, I'm curious to hear if there have been threats generated off of that, um, because attacking people's family members, Judge Chutkin said that was so inherently wrong that she didn't even need to put it in the order because it was so clearly out of bounds. Um, so that's just an interesting wrinkle in all this, too. Roger, what do you think? Are we uh, do you think uh, uh, do you agree with Kyle that we're going to look at a uh, protracted period before which the uh, order is sharply narrowed? Well, I agree that it's going to be narrowed. Uh, I mean, likely will be narrowed. That was the impression I got, too. I actually was a little surprised uh, we, did, we don't have a ruling yet. I, I thought they would uh, be rushing because there is urgency uh, in uh, not having a, a gag order on certain matters. And um, uh, but I, I agree. It sounds like it, it, there's not going to be any. Uh, it didn't sound like uh, th they're not going to prevent him from criticizing Jack Smith or his line prosecutors. Um, a weird thing about the order is that it actually doesn't mention the family, even though the judge seemed to. She said it goes without saying. And but I don't know if it literally goes without saying if you don't put it in the order. And um, so uh, I don't know the status of the family. And then Judge uh, uh, Nina Pillard was was saying uh, uh, she actually had language to replace um, the word targeting in the order. A lot of people had criticized the word targeting as what does it mean exactly? And uh, she was proposing to Bosa, what if you replaced it with such and such? So I do think they're going to um, uh, tweak it and narrow it, but uh, I, 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 I thought they'd be moving more quickly. Anna, what do you think? Are you closer to uh, Kyle, sharply narrowed and slow, or closely, or closer to Roger, uh, quick and uh, more gently narrow, narrowed? <laughs> I mean, look, I'm going to take the 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 middle ground between those positions. So uh, maybe not as narrowly tailored as as Kyle thinks, um, but and also uh, maybe not as fast as as Roger thinks somewhere uh, in between. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I don't know. I just don't have a good sense of, of it, uh, based on the oral argument. And, uh, I think that it's hard to tell, but, you know, I defer to Roger and Kai, or I would, if they didn't have such, uh, <laughs> d differing views, cause they're the, you know, pretty men, uh, uh, courthouse experts and the DC, uh, district court and DC circuit experts. So, um, I think it does say a lot though, that they have two very different reads on it. But I, I will say, we don't know that as to your point earlier, that whether this information that was supplemented based on what happened in the threats generated in New York that are, you know, hard evidence of what Trump's tweets do, will that change the calculus? Because we haven't heard the circuit weigh in on that. That, that could, uh, point in favor of Roger's interpretation here if the court takes that seriously. And one, and every time the court suspend these gag orders, Trump just adds more, I mean, just pours more, you know, coal into the furnace about, you know, that to, you know, justify the original gag orders. And so that may change the calculus and speed it up. 
Okay, I just want to weigh in with what uh, the right answer is. The right answer mm -hmm. is that Roger is correct on the speed um, and uh, 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 the exact percentage that will be lopped off of the uh, substance of the gag order is uh, 19. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to have 19% shave and it's going to be just a few days, more days. Um, Thanksgiving got in the way. Uh, you know, Judge Pillard had a, had a lot of turkey, and uh, and it's just, you know, there was a there was a lot of there were they all had a lot of dishes to to do. All right, um, uh, Roger. One thing that Thanksgiving has gotten in the way of is the. Uh, the uh, Colorado, uh, our discussion of the Colorado uh, court decision on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And I want to apologize to everybody about this. They released this right before the holiday. Um, we got a, a very critical note from a law professor who's involved in this, accusing us of a deafening silence on the subject of Colorado Section 3 uh, to if you're watching, uh, Professor, um, I, I, I'm my humblest apologies. Um, we are uh, we're a small operation, and when a court dumps a major opinion uh, that is not an emergency to comment on right before a holiday, sometimes we're going to celebrate the holiday. So I hope you. Uh, uh, professor had an excellent Thanksgiving. I certainly did. Um, but Roger, uh, what did the judge in Colorado do? It's one of the strangest rulings I have run across in a while. So, uh, judge, this is a state court judge, state, uh, Sarah B. Wallace. Um, and you remember there was a week long trial and, uh, and she finally gave the ruling and she ruled uh, at, well, I'm sure you all know this, uh, most of it, the, the headlines. Um, uh, it, it, she ruled for the petitioners on almost everything down to including uh, that January 6th was an insurrection, that uh, Trump incited the insurrection, that Trump engaged in insurrection within the meaning of Section 3 but that section three doesn't reach presidents, uh, that was the ruling. And so this case could have been thrown out before trial on that issue a long time ago without the trial, but uh, she wanted to hear from professors on that question as well as on some of the others, that's what she said. And what the result is we now have a very, very full record that both sides can appeal. And all of the issues go up uh, to the states. They go directly to the state Supreme Court uh, because this is an expedited proceeding under a particular Colorado statute designed to challenge uh, uh, the qualifications of uh, people on the ballot. And um, uh, so it, it was a. I, it, it surprised me. I, I, I think it surprised everybody. Um, it was, uh, and and also I think um, of the very many reasons you could you know wriggle out of having to rule on something like this. I don't think many people thought the, uh, the that uh, this particular argument was where it would uh, uh, it would be the hangup. I think a lot of people thought, well, there's a big issue about whether Section Three is self-executing. Can you know? Does Congress have to enact a particular, you know, uh, uh, cause of action or a way of uh, judging somebody's qualifications? Um, there were, you know, you could have dismissed it on sort of technical state grounds that you know, uh, uh, and you could have said, well, it's a primary. Uh, 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 the the parties are uh, in control of primaries. We can push it off. Uh, there's a tr trillion ways, and she ruled for the petitioners all the way down the line. And uh, she actually said the insurrection question was, you know, a fairly easy one. Uh, the at least the insurrection part. I'm not saying the engaging in or the incitement, but uh, so it's it was really pretty remarkable. And and 
uh, it came out on a Friday. The p- petitioners, uh, I don't know how they did it, filed their appeal brief, the full brief, not just notice of appeal, Monday. You know, they went through the weekend and um, uh, it was, uh, and it's a good brief. And um, and so now, and, and we're going to get here, it's very expedited, uh, Wednesday, December 6th, uh, will be the oral argument um, uh, at 1 p.m. Mountain Time and uh, 3 p.m. our time, I mean, Eastern Time. And um, so uh, it, it's a pretty, pretty remarkable thing. All right. So uh, for those who are confused by the idea that you could have a highly developed record, that there was an insurrection uh, that the president engaged in it uh, and are saying to themselves, wait a minute, are you saying that th- that the Congress that sent was aware, you know, that Jefferson Davis, um, you know, pa- uh, and, um, you know, if this, if Robert E. Lee had run for president, it would not have prevented you know, this is a civil war amendment. Um, is this argument uh, a, a a serious one in your view, or is it a a, a kind of a gotcha that uh, I mean, how seriously should we take the idea that that the Fourteenth Amendment Congress, you know, the the radical Republicans? Um, might have exempted the presidency and the vice presidency from the disqualification? Um, It's a, well, it's a serious argument now. And uh, it's um, a, a, you know, the judge admitted she could not think of why they would have done this. Uh, It does seem to make no sense. But, you know, uh, the conservative uh, jurisprudence, you know, plain meaning, textualism, uh, you're not supposed to care about intent so much. It's sort of what do the words say and what would they, how would they have been understood? Clearly, they won't, weren't understood this way um, uh, in terms of intent. Um, uh, there was enormous amount of talking about the need to keep Jefferson Davis from running for president. And, you know, each time there was an amnesty act after the section three was enacted, you know, there was discussion again, we have to craft the amnesty act so it doesn't cover uh, uh, Jefferson Davis because we don't want him running for president. That would be crazy. And um, so they thought this covered him, but, uh, and I should say for readers, there are really, for listeners, that there are really two arguments that are semi-distinct, uh, or some people think they're distinct and some people don't think they're distinct, but that there's two arguments because you remember the way section three works is it's incredibly gnarly. And the idea is first, who is covered by, it? well, you have to take a an oath to support the constitution uh, to, in the process of, of taking certain list of positions. So that's the triggering event, the oath taking and uh, and one and the uh, the oath to become president is not mentioned specifically. It says senators, republic uh, uh, senators, uh, representatives and officers of the United States. Most of us say, duh, that, you know, but the, a case can be made blah, 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 lawyers, you know, and then. Uh, uh, no, the, the core of the yeah. argument is that the president is not an officer of the United States. Yeah. He takes a different oath. Exactly. And that the yeah. presidential oath um, is uh, and therefore uh, he is not covered by the and other officers. Right. Uh, that's right. And then uh, the second half of it is if you take that oath and then you engage in insurrection, you are barred from holding a different, I mean, a similar but slightly different set of offices. And it's described there as uh, 
uh, any office, civil or military, under the United States. So the question is, okay, is that, does that include the president? And um, and interestingly enough, uh, one of the professors who's been uh, most adamant from the beginning, or I, at least, I mean, not, well, uh, from early on, uh, a couple of these professors that have been most adamant, um, uh, Seth Tillman and, and Josh Blackman, that, that the president is not, uh, uh, his oath is not included, have not committed on the other half of it. They don't know about does it bar presidents? They say it, the triggering oath of a president doesn't count, but they won't. They haven't taken a p p position on the other half of it. Um, uh, so these are distinct points. Well, there is. One, one, it, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. One point I was going to make too was the judge emphasized this, and it's actually a really fascinating part of it. Is Trump is sort of a not you know is sort of a unicorn in all this because he's the only president who hasn't taken one of those other oaths, <laughs> um, you know, just because he came from where he did is not not a you know not a elected official in any other capacity, um, and so it just you know you couldn't have crafted a ruling like this in, for any other person that would somehow result in him still being eligible to be on the ballot. Right, because he's held no previous office, right? right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, Professor, uh, our silence, our deafening silence has been broken. We acknowledge that there has been an important event in Colorado at the district court level. And uh, uh, and we uh, we repent and humbly apologize for our uh, uh, silence over Thanksgiving and the uh, week around it. All right, Roger, before we move on uh, to Coffee County and get bogged down in the uh, minutia of, of, uh, of, of Coffee County, uh, let's talk about the minutia of 1512C, which uh, for those who don't remember is the obstruction statute that a whole lot of uh, uh, January 6th prosecutions turn on. This is now before the Supreme Court and they're going to uh, decide whether to decide whether to decide about it, right? Yeah, uh, the cert petition is uh, before the court and uh, the conference is tomorrow, as I understand it. So this is on, uh, there are really two challenges relating to 18 U.S.C. 1512 C. 2. This is the felony that is sort of the most, well, one of the most important felonies in January 6th criminal cases. Uh, at least 317 people have been charged with it. Uh, Trump is charged with essentially two versions of it in, in District of Columbia. And uh, so it's an important statute. And there are two challenges. One has to do with what does it cover? Does it cover... Uh, does it cover, uh, uh, it is called corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding. And so can you corruptly obstruct an official proceeding through violence or must it be only through tampering with evidence? So uh, uh, the judges below in the District of Court uh, uh, of, of Columbia, almost all of them, uh, at least 15, um, said that, uh, yeah, you can obstruct it uh, with with violence. Um, but one said, no, it has to be tampering with evidence. And that case is now coming to uh, the, the D.C. circuits <laughs> sort of affirmed. It, it was three different opinions. It was very hard to, to put it all together, but it affirmed. And um, and now that one is bef a, a, a conference before the Supreme Court. And, and as I understand it, so Monday, we will probably, there will probably be, uh, well, uh, at, at 10 a.m., they might grant cert, they could uh, deny cert, or they could relist, which means uh, uh, you, you listened in uh, for nothing. Uh, you know, it just gets pushed off another uh, till the next conference. 
And what are you realistically expecting here? I, 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 Kyle, this goes for you too. I look at this and say, you know, there's no conflict in the circuits. Um, the DC circuit is split on the question, but so what? Mm -hmm. um, there actually is some controlling law in the DC circuit. And um, so I'm not really sure why the Supreme Court should grant cert in it. On the other hand, um, I could also look at it and say, if we're thinking about this from a mischievous conservative judges who want to throw a wrench in January 6th prosecutions combined with earnest conservative judges who actually have a long history of narrowing uh, uh, obstruction statutes and, and certain other statutes uh, in particularly as it relates to white collar cases combined with their uh, liberal colleagues who feel the same way about the same statutes. Um, uh, maybe you see, uh, I don't know, six votes, five votes or four votes to grant cert on the theory that the government's been too aggressive here. I mean, the only thing I'd say is I'm not sure these are the right cases, the ones that are currently pending to to reach the the most important issues on this, because the the three cases that are pending before the the court right now are cases that were in, which all involved uh, violent defendants. And so the question of whether you corruptly obstructed an official proceeding is kind of settled for, for all of those cases. The, the whole reason that got to the appeals court was because Judge Nichols, the one district court judge who broke from all of his colleagues, said you have to physically destroy, you know, evidence, you know, take 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 papers out of a out of a desk, you know, to 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 obstruct an official proceeding. That was kind of an a, a out of left field sort of argument that that the circuit pretty easily dispatched with, um, even in their split ruling uh, on this. But the, the issue was that even in the circuit, they said, we didn't really take briefing on what it means to corruptly obstruct an official proceeding. The definition of corruptly um, is a huge uh, question mark hanging over the, the obstruction law, but these cases didn't really reach that. And the circuit was never brief, briefed on that. There's another case that was resolved recently um, called and the, the Robertson case uh, in which someone was not uh, charged with, I mean, he, he, he uh, I think did get an he impeded police officers in some way, but it wasn't, wasn't quite the same violent assault that these others were charged with. And he challenged it in that, in that case, corruptly, the definition of corruptly was at the heart of his appeal and that, to me, is one where the, the Supreme Court may be more interested in, in trying to settle this question, and it, it's just not quite on the, at, moving along at the same pace as the others. What do you think, Roger? Is they going to pass on this one and wait for Robertson? There, there is another... Uh, well, it, it might make sense, and there's another aspect of this one that's different from Robertson, which is that this one is an interlocutory appeal. Mm -hmm. He hasn't gone to trial. And it usually, the Supreme Court doesn't usually take criminal interlocutory appeals. It, it, you can send it, let it go. And, you know, if he's convicted, fine, then you can appeal and I'll, I'll hear the whole thing. So that would be one excuse. The Robertson case, uh, they just, it, it, there's another interesting thing. Strategically, they in this Fisher case, it was called at the D.C. court level. It's, it will now probably have a different name, but um, there were. Um, um, I, I I think I've. That's all right. I've, well, uh, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, no worries. All right, let's go to. Oh, fight. I I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Uh, uh, they chose ordinarily, you know, they got three ruling, three rulings from three judges. So ordinarily, you might say you might move for re rehearing and bank. You know, you have all these judges on the court. I don't know how many there are on the D.C. Circuit, but, you know, maybe nine or 12 active duty. And so why not clarify this? Why leave it with three different rulings strategically? The plaintiffs, the uh, uh, 
defendant didn't want to do that because it's it's a mostly democratic bench and it would have made the ruling stronger in favor of the Department of Justice. So they only moved for rehearing a panel rehearing that was denied. So it went up in this crazy position. Now the Robertson case, the one uh, uh, Kyle is talking about, they are moving for rehearing and bank of, of their case, which focuses on the corruptly issue. But they say, in order to understand that, we need the end bank court to rule on what the other case, Fisher, meant, because they're inter interwoven. And, and so the sensible thing to do, if they realize this is happening, is to say, yes, let's not take this one. Let's wait to hear what happens with Robertson. Maybe we get an end bank ruling uh, and, and so on. All right. Let us go to Fulton County and from there to Coffee County. Uh, Anna Bauer, um, uh, uh, first of all, let's start in Coffee County. You had another giant tome this week on the uh, machinations in Coffee County. We have a whole podcast coming out about it tomorrow. So uh, I we're going to go a little bit light on it here, but what is the uh, 60 second version of, uh, you know, everything wrong with the uh, Georgia Bureau of Investigations report on Coffee County? Right. So we, we do have a podcast coming out tomorrow morning. So everyone, please check that out for a longer discussion between Ben and I about this. But the, the short elevator pitch version is that uh, the GBI con conducted this separate investigation that was in parallel with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. They were investigating these things at the same time. But the GBI has a, a wider jurisdiction than the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, although, of course, Fonnie Willis was able to expand her probe because of the uh, kind of specifics of bringing a RICO prosecution. She's alleged that the Coffee County voting system breach was a part of the RICO conspiracy to overturn the election. Uh, but she also is, is more limited in terms of uh, resources and, and just in, in terms of the ability to have a dedicated probe that's just focused on the breach of voting systems. And as and we know that in, in part because there are 30 unindicted co-conspirators in the Fulton County indictment, um, and some of those unindicted co-conspirators are people who are alleged to have uh, either participated in, in planning uh, the, the breach of voting systems in Coffee County or distributing the data that resulted from that forensics uh, uh, copying and testing. Um, but... So all of that is to say that it did matter what the GBI was doing um, and whether they completed a thorough and complete investigation. Based on their report, it, it seems to be the case that they had some really striking uh, and, and quite baffling omissions in terms of, uh, you know, it, leaving things out that uh, could connect the dots between this, you know, alleged conspiracy between the the former president's legal team uh, and and uh, some people who are, you know, rural folks uh, in in South Georgia. Uh, you know, that's a, a pretty serious allegation that's in the Fulton County indictment. And it seems to be the case that you would think that there would be a serious investigation of it. But they only interviewed about 15 witnesses in, in 13 months. And most of those interviews were, uh, you know, took place in less than an hour. Uh, most of those folks were people who were at the, you know, Coffee County level. They really didn't in, uh, seek interviews in many cases uh, with people who were, uh, you know, maybe uh, former Trump campaign uh, uh, officials or, or people who were involved with the campaign who seemed to have some kind of at least personal knowledge knowledge of, of what was going on and maybe what was leading up to uh, this breach. Um, and and uh, they basically just relied on civil litigation and the January 6th committee report um, and depositions and instead of kind of doing an independent investigation. So I, I hope everyone does check out that conversation between Ben and I for a uh, you know, longer discussion about some of the significance of all of this, because I do think it's important. 
Yeah, I have uh, shared it in the chat in both the uh, 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 the Zoom and the um, uh, the YouTube. Did I? Am I losing? Am I? Am I still here? You are oh, still here. Okay. Yeah, I have shared it in the chat in both the YouTube and the Zoom. And um, uh, and for those who are listening on the podcast, you can find it on the Lawfare website. The story is uh, what the GBI missed in Coffee County. Okay, so meanwhile, uh, Anna, we have had a hearing go by in which uh, the judge decided not to lock him up and him being uh, uh, Harrison Floyd, who is not to be confused with Harrison Ford. Um, and then we have a big hearing tomorrow that is notable because it is going to debut Trump's uh, crocodile boot wearing Georgia lawyer. So let's start with uh, Harrison Floyd, who is not to be confused with Harrison Ford. Uh, who is this guy and why did Fonnie Willis want to lock him up and what was awesome about the hearing? Yep. I don't think I'm breaking up. I think it's Anna who's breaking up. Okay. No. I think it's me. Oh no. I don't know. I've had such a good uh, internet connection. So I hope you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, Okay, perfect. I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to uh, keep talking. Okay, so Harrison Floyd is one of Trump's co-defendants in Fulton County, which we are now down to 15 co-defendants after four of those co-defendants have pleaded out. Uh, Harrison Floyd is indicted in addition to the larger RICO conspiracy. Uh, he's indicted under that kind of prong of the conspiracy that involves this uh, pressure campaign and, and intimidation, alleged intimidation campaign against Ruby Freeman, um, in which, you know, prosecutors allege that uh, Harrison Floyd and and some other co-defendants uh, try to you know pressure her into claiming that she had committed electoral fraud when when she had not in fact uh, uh, committed election fraud. Um, so he the, and and what happened, of course, just by way of background, really quickly, uh, if if folks remember before the Thanksgiving holidays, Harrison Floyd had been making statements about some of his co-defendants and witnesses on Twitter. He's a prolific. Twitter user. Um, and he he made some comments, for example, about uh, Jenna Ellis, his former co-defendant, in which he called her a mess and said that she had uh, accused her of lying in her in her proffer video uh, after her guilty plea. Uh, he also talked about uh, Brad Raffensperger and Gabe Sterling, who are secretary of state officials in Georgia, who are presumptive witnesses in the case. He called them um pieces of and then he you know used the the poop emoji can i just say this hearing was so prim about referring to the the fecal, fecal matter the fecal think, matter emoji you, you know I'm, <laughs> I, you know guys uh we're all adults here you know you can say he called them a piece of shit uh, yeah i i know like Fonnie willis <laughs> was really like uh, i don't want you to describe that emoji um it was awesome Right. And so and so we had this hearing and I think that this hearing, the reason I, I want to remark or want to talk about it just for a moment before we move on to tomorrow, a preview of tomorrow's hearing is that it was our first time seeing Fonnie Willis in court arguing a motion. That's something that's really rare uh, to see the district attorney herself actually show up and argue a motion. Usually, you know, it's the line prosecutor. It's in this case, there's a dedicated prosecution team who has effectively done all of the arguments except for, you know, to my memory, there was one time after the special grand jury finished its work and Fonnie Willis kind of did a little introductory, you know, statement. But other than that, she has not uh, personally appeared since the indictment was handed down in August. So it was really interesting to see her in, in court arguing before Judge McAfee. She delivered a really, you know, fiery she uh, is an impressive argument you could tell it was something impressive yeah. trial advocate i i gotta say you know people people have a lot of hot takes about fonnie willis but that woman knows how to argue in front of a judge and she lost this motion 
uh, but uh, you could sh she was compelling. I, I mean, I just think it's a it was a really interesting portrait of her. Yeah, and it was a really tense hearing. I will say I was in court that day instead of, you know, following it on the live stream. And there were a lot of things that kind of just were happening in between, you know, moments in between, uh, you know, arguments where there was just really high tension between the defendant, Harrison Floyd, and the prosecution team when we were taking breaks before, you know, Judge McAfee entered a new bond modification. He was, you know, making comments about the prosecution team. He he was very defiant. They were, of course, very, you know, uh, eager to uh, argue this motion forcefully. So it was really just a, a very dramatic hearing. And, and Judge McAfee ultimately decided uh, to just modify the, the terms of his bond agreement rather than, you know, send him to the Fulton County Jail for the remainder of or potentially for the remainder of the duration while he awaits trial, which could be, you know, uh, more a year or more um, at this point. So uh, it's it uh, seems to be that he, uh, you know, was was focused on giving uh, uh, Floyd, a, a stern kind of warning or talking to, um, but he ultimately just decided not to revoke his bond. Yeah. Judge McAfee, once again, the man with the hardest job in this entire, uh, uh, business. Um, I mean, you know, everybody else has got, he's got just as much Trump as everybody else. And he's got 18 other co-defendants, uh, and, uh, a whole lot of them are pretty nuts. Um, and Harrison Floyd, who is not to be confused with Harrison Ford, is an unusual character. And uh, this was just another day at the office. And I, you know, I walked into that hearing having no idea what the judge was going to do. And he listened to everybody. It was like a three hour hearing, maybe more. Uh, and he continues to show an independent streak. So for those of you, who hate the Federalist Society and think that all Federalist Society jurists are, you know, Eileen Cannon. Uh, remember, Scott McAfee, FedSoc, University of Georgia, and only a few years ago, too. He's barely, like, you know, barely out of uh, uh, law school, this guy. All right. Um, Anna, we are going to go to audience questions uh, in a moment. So if you have a question and you are in the Zoom, Added, this is your last chance to add questions to the Q&A. Uh, and we're going to go to questions as soon as Anna finishes telling us about tomorrow's crocodile boot debut of Steve Sadow, uh, uh, super lawyer for Donald Trump, uh, who I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see him argue. What's he, what are they going to be yapping about and uh, what kind of boots do you think he will be wearing? You know, I got to go. He's probably going to wear the Caymans. I got the Cayman crocodile boots. That's I I, I feel like I, I think twice when I've seen him because I ask every time that I see him in court. And I think it's twice now that he has been wearing the Caymans. Can you get a picture of him with the boots? I Well, the, I, I do think that that's yes. like something that for the for the dispatch, we need a boots picture. I, I agree. I, I think we need a boots picture. I am still upset that because Ken Chesbro pleaded out, we never got to use the um, Impala Loya picture pictures of uh, Scott Grubman that we had. Um, but uh, and, they, they will not go stale. With a, yeah. With uh, but I I um, I will also mention that um, uh, there is a profile out in The New York Times today by Richard Fawcett, and uh, it's very good. But he did not mention the cowboy boot collection. So I I um, just, you know, think that if if anybody needs their exclusive reporting on uh, the Steve Sadow's cowboy boots, then Lawfare is the place to be. That's right. Um, but. Uh, so I, I will say in terms of tomorrow, we have a lot of motions to get through, and I, I don't think we have time to discuss all of them. Uh, uh, some of them are motions that Judge McAfee 
in the Chesbro and Powell, uh, you know, speedy trial uh, uh, hearings has already ruled on some of those motions. Uh, it's things like, you know, the Electoral Count Act and supremacy clause. It's uh, things about whether the indictment sufficiently alleges a RICO enterprise or, you know, continuity. So there are things like that. There's also, I think, though, what the the main issue that I'm looking at uh, tomorrow uh, that seems to be at the top of of um, Steve Sadow's mind is the First Amendment arguments that they have adopted, which, uh, you know, Ray Smith had offered in one of his motions you know, it's a very kind of vague and broadly worded uh, motion. So it's kind of hard to tell exactly what they will be arguing. And, and in fact, the district attorney's office has has made the argument that, you know, there it's so vague that they should be, you know, kind of precluded from arguing it or that they should have to expand on it in writing and allow the district attorney to respond. Um, but we do know that Steve Sadow has this on his mind because he filed a a supplemental motion in which he said, you know, even though Judge McAfee's already ruled on this with respect to Chesbro and Powell, and even though he's already denied it, you know, here's why we have some supplemental authority, which um, which means that basically, Judge McAfee, you you weren't right uh, <laughs> when you when you ruled on Chesbro and Powell's uh, arguments on this. You you can, in fact, you know, make a different decision here. Uh, and then also, uh, Steve Sadow says in that motion, even though he's already adopted this one, he wants to be able to submit his own kind of independent First Amendment argument on behalf of Trump. Um, so I, I, there may be some discussion about, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, can he go beyond the scope of, of what he's adopted through Ray Smith's motion? So it's all going to be a little bit confusing because it's not entirely clear, you know, what exactly they're arguing, although it does seem to be that this is a First Amendment as applied argument. So they're saying not that the statute, mm -hmm. you know, is itself unconstitutional under the First Amendment, but um, it is as applied to the facts of this case unconstitutional because, you know, it's political speech and, and that kind of thing. The other thing that's interesting that I just briefly, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll stop there. But so, so the, well, one more thing, sorry, before we move on to audience questions. Another thing that's at issue that I'm interested to see what happens tomorrow is this motion that Steve Sadow has submitted to Judge McAfee about uh, getting discovery or at least kind of compelling the district attorney's office to ask the uh, special counsel's office for, you know, certain uh, kind of descriptions of, of the relevant evidence or witnesses in the federal case that's in discovery um, so that he can ascertain whether or not any of that might be things that they need in terms of uh, uh, Trump's defense in the Fulton County case. So that'll be interesting, but there's a lot more there. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a long hearing and I'm interested to see what happens. And what time is that tomorrow? That's at 1.30 tomorrow. I'm actually a little bit surprised that he said it for 1.30 because, I mean, it seems like it's going to be a very lengthy hearing. So who knows? Uh, we could be there for uh, for a long time. But, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah, 1.30 tomorrow and we'll have it uh, up on the Lawfare No Bull uh, after the hearing's over so that people can listen to it wherever they get their podcast. Right. So you can listen to that hearing as well as the Harrison Floyd hearing on the Lawfare No Bull feed. Uh, and uh, that will be shared in uh, a link to those podcast or to that feed will be shared in the chat. Um, okay, uh, we have six questions. We're going to get through them all. Julia, uh, unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Okay, am I unmuted? You certainly are. Okay. Um, this is a little bit off topic of what, what we've been talking about, what you guys have been talking it's about this afternoon. It's solidly in scope. Okay, then. Um, my question is about the appeals that the DOJ announced after the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys sentences that they uh, intended to appeal those sentences. 
Um, the, the Oath Keepers announcement, I think, was in July. And the one about the uh, appealing the Proud Boys sentences was uh, last month, I think. But I haven't seen any reporting that this that they have been filed. Um, can you talk about this? Is this something that the DOJ does often, that they signal they're going to do something and then they don't do it? Or what? Oh, they He's... did it. Uh, Roger, oh, they what, did. Can, what can you tell us about the uh, Oath Keepers and Proud Boys appeals? Um, I, I don't think uh, anybody on either side has yet filed, actually filed the first appellate brief. Uh, do you know, Kyle? I they haven't yet. And I, I, I do have to check back on the dockets to see if there's been any updates. But I, I my understanding is they've all they filed the, the notice of appeal and, and yeah. you know, get the ball rolling. But you're right. No substantive briefs yet, which I'm also eager to see. But yeah. those are you wouldn't have expected that. Well, so wait a minute. The the Oath Keepers won. <clears throat> you might have expected by now, but the Proud Boys mm -hmm. won. Not you wouldn't have by now. Right. That's right. We're nowhere near with respect to the Proud Boys, but uh, we are getting close with respect to the Oath Keepers, I would think. Normally, but I have no reason to doubt that they're going to, especially because there's no question that the defendants are appealing. And so there will be, you know, uh, a cross appeal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a very simple reason why the government will pursue this appeal. And that is these are significantly below guideline sentences that affect a whole lot of other sentences, mm -hmm. both those that have been already imposed. Uh, because if you set, you know, Enrique Tario and uh, uh, the one-eyed man um, uh, uh, here instead of here, then nobody can go above. They People have to be scaled down. And so it affects a whole lot of other sentences and the government is going to take the position that they should have received a re a, a guideline sentence. And th that means a lot more years than they both got. Whether, and, you know, people, a lot of people, including me, don't love federal sentencing because it's really, really harsh. And I'm, you know, not personally uncomfortable with the sentences that either of those guys got as to as you know deficient but if you represent the criminal division of the uh, of the united states or the special counsel's office uh which in this case you, you uh uh it the relevant actor is the u.s attorney's office and and the criminal division you want to push those sentences as high as you can both for their impact on the individuals and for the other uh people who that creates a ceiling for I actually sort of, I, I sort of disagree. I think these are the bad facts to take these sorts of appeals, especially some of the Oath Keeper cases. Uh, and, you know, the use of the terror enhancement in these cases is also unusual. It, you know, they're not uh, typical terror enhancement cases. The um, so I, 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 they seem like losers to me. I'm, I'm surprised they're doing this. So I, uh, we had this argument at the time of the sentences, and uh, Roger uh, is in this case uh, disadvantaged by having actually sat at the trials and uh, um, knowing what he's talking about. I have no such encumbrances um, and simply know how the Justice Department behaves. And when they get a deficient sentence in a high profile case and it caps other sentences, they do appeal it. And so I don't think we're actually disagreeing. I think you're responding to the cases that were presented and I am describing the typical behavior of the United States Department of Justice. I'll also mention that not many January 6th cases are being capped by these because like the four Proud Boys have, you know, uh, four of the top five, something like that, sentences of any of the, you know, any January 6th defendant, you know, the one exception being somebody that had 38 priors. And no, but they're but they're capping each other's sentences. You know, so if, if you're if you're if Stuart Rhodes is what is he, 18 years or or um, yeah. then all the other Oath Keepers are going to be below that. And so if you're the Justice Department and you can bump him up to 25 years, um, then, you know, then he's not 
you know, limiting uh, the others in the same way. And I, I just think that's going to be the way they think about it. What do you think, Kyle? I think that's right. I think there was some also the, the floor that Judge Mehta set for some of these Oath Keepers was kind of surprising. I think there's a principle at stake in terms of the, the, the actual crime of seditious conspiracy, which I think the character of a seditious conspiracy is so grave that the government wants it to be reflected in the sentences, um, at, at least in the guidelines range, because you know it, it, it's often analogized to, to, to treason, and at least in, sometimes in the in the legal setting, it's it's analogized to that. It's, it's, but one of the most serious crimes you can commit against you know, against your own government, and so I think there's something you know. You know, I think Judge Meta, like like you, says federal sentencing is overly harsh. The terror enhancement jacks up sentences so dramatically that it's out of whack with what they sh- these people should be getting. And that's why he did what he did. But I think prosecutors will look at that and say, if you commit seditious conspiracy against our government, oh, you know, a one year or two year sentence for some even for some of the, the people on the lower end of the conduct spectrum, um, it seems, uh, uh, you know, hard to imagine, hard to hard to justify um, and Meta has sort of boxed in you know, some of the people, you know, you know, Ed Vallejo, who managed the weapons cache at, in Arlington while the Oath Keepers were storming the Capitol. I think he got three years with one of those being on home confinement. So it was kind of, you know, Meta set a pretty low floor. Yeah. So I think I think you, you know, whichever I, I, I mean, I, I have not studied the individual cases at a level where I could say, here's what I think the appropriate sentence is for that. I certainly defer to Roger on that. I do think if you want to understand what the Justice Department is doing, the factors that Kyle just laid out and that I laid out are the are highly explanatory of DOJ behavior. All right, we got five more questions to get through and uh, we can't spend as much time as we did on that one. Uh, Nathan asks, hypothetically, if Trump is convicted in DC and Fulton County cases, and given that we are talking about a former potential or future president, one that a future Republican president will likely pardon anyways, Generally speaking, what kind of remedies, penalties, and other measures are available to the prosecutors, judges, and juries to consider? Would home imprisonment be a likely measure, at least for the federal cases? I think this is an easy question because the answer is we have nobody has any idea. Uh, There's no law, there's no precedent, there's no anything for this uh, except to say that. Uh, judges can be creative. The Bureau of Prisons can be creative. The Secret Service will make demands because they continue to have a protective function with respect to Donald Trump. And the state of Georgia, I don't know how creative Georgia uh, uh, confinement can be, but I, I think you should expect everybody to operate in a zone of uh uh, working stuff out in a way that allows uh, uh, that allows a punishment to be effectuated in a fashion that's consistent with different actors' uh, needs. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, how is the Colorado judge's ruling on Trump's disqualification based on a plausible reading of the 14th Amendment and any existing presidents? What is the reasoning behind the interpretation? Uh, so we sort of covered this, um, uh, the work to understand the, the reading, the, the reading here, there's really, uh, two things to read in my opinion. One is the work, the, the opinion by the judge itself lays it, lays it out pretty coherently. Uh, and it, it closely tracks the argument that it's, that Roger summarized it very well, that it, it has to do with the definition of officer, um, it and and the differences between the presidential oath and the uh, the uh, the specified oaths, um, and then the professors who have uh, most vociferously advanced this theory in academic writing are Josh Blackman and Seth Barrett Tillman, who sometimes write for Lawfare. Um, uh, but in this case, they have written this material elsewhere. Uh, Josh has a law review article on the subject. And as Roger says, it focuses on the first half of this. That is the 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 question of whether the president is an officer. I have to jump. 
Sorry, right. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I got to yeah. jump. My kids we're, are getting home. And we're going to so, say goodbye to Kyle. Nice we, to spend time thanks, with you all. Kyle. Great, thanks for joining it. us. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. The next question is Jacob. Uh, Jacob, unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, I know we didn't talk about Florida because um, who wants to? But um, And I know it's popular to speculate that Cannon, Judge Cannon's in the bag, but isn't it just as likely or as possible that she's just bad as a judge. She's no Scott McAfee. And she's not gonna... no los dos. I mean, exactly. like, well, right. And she's just... just bad. You tend <laughs> right. to make errors in all kinds of different directions. The striking thing about Judge Cannon is that she has only erred in one direction and has done so on a on a kind of dramatically repeat basis. And I think until... I, I, I will remain suspicious of her until I start seeing like really bad errors that tend in the government's favor. But that's just me. I mean, look, if you want to speculate that she's just a lousy judge, that's a very fair and maybe generous interpretation. I don't know. What, what, what do you think, Roger and, and you, Anna? You guys have actually seen her in action. I I I don't think it's just uh, uh, inexperience. Um, there's a there is a I think as you say there is a a trend and a, a uniform direction. I also think if you look at the direction, this gets a little, you know, this is my Dr. Parloff's corner part of the program, but. Uh, getting psychological, but she, when it comes to ruling for the government, which she sometimes does, she won't issue a ruling explaining that. She just does it, and she does it very quietly, as if she doesn't want to draw attention. And then, if if, if it's a ruling against, or if she will propose, or she will she gets involved. She she suggests that. You know, the defense lawyer should look into this, look into brief this for me, brief this argument you haven't raised. And and those she'll write at she will write about even if there there's very little there. So uh, it, to me, it's a very strange picture. All right. Uh, penultimate question. Is the Colorado Supreme Court likely to send the question of Trump on the ballot back to the lower court as opposed to infirming in part and reversing in part, in which case presumably both sides would try to appeal to the Supreme Court? Uh, Roger, my impression is that we don't know how they're going to handle it, but whatever they do, I think it's likely to go to the Supreme Court before it goes back to the trial court, right? Yeah, I think they understand that the you know time is of the essence. They've put a very expedited schedule. I think they understand they're not the final word. Also, probably, and that the the important thing is to rule, and that's how she you know she, she said that early on. She said, "Look, I, I'm not deciding. I'm, my role is to get this to the Supreme Court. You know, in, in a way so, so that they can make these decisions." Jonathan, you get the last question today, and it's clearly for Anna. But you got to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, apologies if I missed this at the beginning, but uh, do we know why we haven't seen more guilty pleas in Georgia? Yeah, it's a good question. I kind of expected we might be seeing some more uh, after, you know, that first wave of, of them, but... I think that there's a few for each defendant, it's kind of unique and it depends on, you know, you've got a group who are going through removal proceedings, so they might want to try to wait to see what happens with that. You've got a group who I think are very convinced of their innocence and of the, you know, they're kind of true believers, so to speak. So that's people like Harrison Floyd and, and Kathy Latham and uh, people who might have, you know, uh, uh, kind of reasons to not plead out um, because 
of, you know, some of the political or ideological stuff that's going on in the background. Uh, and then you've got, you know, other groups of people who I think it's just the case that they, uh, uh, oh, and I should say also, you know, you've got a group who aren't getting any plea deals, um, which, you know, the Guardian reported, CNN had reported previously. Uh, and then you've also got um, some people who, you know, have really good defense attorneys uh, and, and they're going to wait until some of these dispositive motions are actually filed and, and argued um, before they maybe, you know, move towards a, a plea agreement. Um, but I, I definitely think we're going to see more. It's just a question of when and 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 who. Um, so, but I, I, I don't have a solid answer for you on that. I'm, and I'm sorry that I don't, but, uh, you know, Ben, Roger, are you guys surprised we haven't seen more or, or, or what do you think is going on there? I'm not particularly surprised at this stage. I would think, uh, you know, you have the raft who are uh, who use the threat of a of a quick trial, and now there's a good long time before anything serious is going to happen. So I'm not sure there's quite as much of a rush at this point, particularly for people who aren't necessarily paying by the hour, but you know maybe have you know, retained, you know, retained counsel for, uh, you know, for a lump sum. Right. And I should add to that. There's uh, judge McAfee hasn't set a trial date, of course, but there is a motion pending, uh, that Fonnie Willis has asked for an August 5th trial date in that motion. She also asked him to set up final plea date for, I believe it's in mid June or, or maybe late June. Um, and then, you know, the, the idea being that that's the last date in which a defendant could enter a negotiated plea. Um, and, and then, you know, after that, it would all be, you know, non-negotiated pleas. You can do that in Georgia, where you just kind of go before the judge, plead guilty, and hope that they uh, take pity on you and and give you a lenient sentence. Um, but in those circumstances, after that final plea date, Fonnie Willis says that the state will recommend maximum sentences. So I expect that you know, depending on when Judge McAfee sets that final plea date and and the trial, once we get through some of these dispositive motions and we get closer to that date, that's when we're going to see a kind of avalanche of of people uh potentially pleading out we are gonna leave it there anna bauer from the first amendment lobby roger parloff from the now lit sconce studio kyle cheney uh, uh who's no longer uh, here but whose presence was greatly appreciated and is welcome back anytime thank you all for joining us